Good morning. It's my honor and privilege to welcome you to worship with Redlands United Church of Christ. So often during COVID-19, we use words like virtual worship or online worship. I'd like us to consider today that we are in real and authentic worship when we come together in this way with the people who are connected through space and time and love and devotion to something that is bigger and greater than all of us and something that resides in the heart of our very being. That God is with us and God is still speaking no matter how we connect and that that God, that spirit, that presence is indeed worthy of worship and of our time and our energy and our devotion. And in that spirit, I welcome you to real, authentic worship with Redlands United Church of Christ. Let us pray. Dear heavenly author of our stories, poet of our lives, forgiving biographer of our deepest truths, come among us as we reflect on our history, both written and unwritten, both acknowledged and unacknowledged, both inspiringly proud and heartbreakingly shameful. We ask that you edit the pages of our past, adding footnotes of grace where we didn't know then what we know now. Help us fill the chapters of our future with hard work and hope, with courage and candor and curiosity, with prospects and perseverance and peace, with anger about the status quo and acceptance of the difficult work of change. We pray today that you would come and help us in seeing the pain, going against the grain, getting out of our lane, erasing the stain, using our brain, embracing the strain, releasing the chain, refusing to feign, and bringing your reign. Oh, gracious one, we need you now more than ever as we face our past, as we face our future, and as we face ourselves. Come, Holy Spirit, come. 
Fill us with fire, with fierceness, with forgiveness. This we pray in all that is right and just, in your many names. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Children's Circle and thank you for joining me. This morning we are going to talk about a very sly and sneaky way of storytelling. Now most of the time when we think about stories, we think about a book, right? A book with covers and pictures and words and you can find it in a store someplace. But there's another way to tell a story. And sometimes it turns out to be the best way to tell a story if you're hoping that someone else won't notice. So for instance, think about fairy tales. All of the stories of fairy tales tell you something about plain old folk. Folk means people. Plain old folk, their struggles, and how the people in power behaved. Think about Snow White being cast out of the castle and the evil queen who wanted to be the most beautiful and most powerful woman in the whole kingdom coming after her to make sure that she wouldn't ever come back and these little forgotten dwarves who save her. That kind of story. There's three ways that you can find this kind of story. This includes the ones that haven't been adopted by Disney and turned into a cartoon movie. They are folk tales, folk songs, and folk art. Folk tales you're familiar with, like Snow White. There's also some that have been labeled folk tales that you may have heard from Native American nations from around our area. Some of the stories that you've heard even came from slave days. They're hard to recognize as that anymore, but a lot of the stories about right and wrong that you've heard actually came from plantations and not from the owners. They came from the slaves. Folk art is a similar thing. Every time you look at a quilt now, now quilts now are frequently very pretty objects. You can find them in department stores. Some, maybe you know someone that sews quilts and they're trying to think of the right theme and the right patterns to sew everything into. But for many people, including slaves, quilts weren't just a way to keep yourself warm at night. They were a way to tell stories of the people. If you look at different patterns that date back to the times of slavery, you're going to find patterns like the log cabin or the wrench. Look these up, Google that, say, quilt patterns, log cabin, or wrench, and see what they mean, see what they're about, and see why they might have made it into a quilt that the people who owned the plantations, the masters and mistresses, wouldn't really have noticed, because who notices the things that a slave makes? And the third one is folk songs. These are songs that are made up and sung by common people, they usually have instruments that are played in a way that you wouldn't find in a symphony hall or someplace where rich people might put money in. We're talking about songs with lots of banjo, at least in our country, lots of banjo, mandolin, and instruments like that. And we're talking about songs where beat is kept by clapping more than with hands. Think about some of these songs, which you can actually find in our hymnal. One of them is Every Time I Feel the Spirit. You know which song I'm talking about. The chorus goes, Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Now I don't sing it super well, but you've heard it sung very well. This song is so old. It's so enriched in our American culture that if you look up the information about it in the hymnal, all of the information that talks about when it was written, who it was written for, it's not there. All it says is African American spiritual. No one can put a date on it because it was put together 
not by someone with a formal education who could write the words down or write the music, but by a group of people who were oppressed and not allowed to read. These were probably put together by slaves or newly freed slaves. And the whole song tells the story of what you do when you are feeling joy or when you are feeling sadness or when you've been moved by God so much that all you can do is drop down on your knees and pray and remember all the stories that you have heard about a God who saves you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn more about folk tales, folk stories, folk art, folk music. Look it up online or ask your parents, call up your grandparents, ask them what they know about stories. What are stories that have been told and told and told throughout the generations, but never written down or only written down in the last 50 years? Ask them what these stories are. Listen to those stories. These are the stories that will one day either be cemented with words so that they will never change again, or they will be forgotten. But if you listen to them now, you will hear the voice of God coming through every one of them and telling the stories of a people who were trying to make the best of it, even when they had no power and no way to make their own life. These are the stories that will inspire you and will move you to action when you need it. Pray with me. Amazing God, thank you for the stories of the people. Thank you for folk who put these stories in so many different ways that you can't help but notice them if you are willing. In your name we pray, amen. Have a wonderful Sunday, everybody. And I want to know what kind of folk tales that you're coming up with and that you're listening to. Share them on Facebook if you want to, or maybe just at Kid Zone or during youth group. Share them. I am looking forward to this. Good morning and welcome to Redlands United Church of Christ. What a joy it is to be in worship with you this morning. A huge thank you to all who make today a meaningful worship experience. Thank you to our dynamic duo, Barbie and Loring. Thank you to the thought-provoking Aaron. And thank you to our amazing musicians, Zoe and Sophia, Val and Peter. Thank you all for bringing your spirit of love to this worship experience. We do have a few announcements. First, following worship, we will hold our Zoom Fellowship Hour. This evening at 6 p.m., we will hold our drive-by shower of love, and we will meet in the parking lot at 6, and then we will drive to Yukaipa and then out to Highland. Since we will be on the freeways, I want to encourage you not to put balloons on your cars and not to tape posters to your cars because those posters could easily rip off by the wind when you are on the freeway. We do, though, want you to decorate your cars. So please decorate them safely. Last week, we held our drive-by shower of love for the first time, and it was a huge success and a huge thank you to all who participated in it. This week, I will be on vacation, so if you have any pastoral care needs, please contact Reverend Aaron Beardipple. And now, as we move to our prayer concerns, I would like to lift up Joanne, family member of Joette, who has been hospitalized with COVID. We lift up all of those affected by the wildfires in California and the hurricanes on the Gulf Coast. And we offer prayers for Jacob Blake, another unjust shooting of a black man. We pray for Jacob's recovery and we pray for his children who witnessed this shooting. And we continue to pray for racial justice 
and police reform in our country. If you have prayer concerns, I invite you to note those prayer concerns in the comment section below. Let us be a congregation at prayer first, entering into a time of silence. Source of life, who is known by many names. Source of liberation, who calls us to the paths of justice. As we face the storms of life, we hear Christ say, Peace, be still. We grieve with communities suffering from hurricanes, especially most recently Hurricane Laura and those who are struggling to recover. Peace, be still. We lift up those who are facing the havoc of COVID in their personal lives with families, communities, nation, and world and we pray peace be still we pray for teachers students educators parents who are navigating distance learning during these challenging times and we pray peace be still. We pray for those who are facing financial hardship, relationship challenges, and illnesses of all kinds. Peace. Be still. As the winds blow and the storms rage, we pray. Peace, be still. May we find our refuge in you. Center us in your deep peace. Calm our anxieties. Still our worries. Peace, be still. We pray all this in the name of the one who walks on the waters of chaos. We pray this in the name of the Prince of Peace, praying our God in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I need to be very clear with you today that the worship leaders don't choose the scriptures. The minister does that. So if you have problems with the scriptures I'm reading today, as I do, you need to talk to Jill. Our reading today comes from Genesis chapter 9, verses 20 through 27. Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. May God make space for Japheth, and let him live in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. And now, from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. May God bless this reading and our understanding of this scripture. Thank you, Peter, for that gorgeous solo. 
lift every voice and sing. So inspiring. Today, we conclude our sermon series, The Gospel According to Hamilton. And there is much to celebrate. Hamilton won 11 Tony Awards, including Best Musical, as well as the Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Hamilton awakened in the hearts of young people a love for U.S. history. Hamilton cast the founding fathers as people of color, radically revising our understanding of the meaning of this country's origins. Hamilton is an immigrant story. It is a justice story. It is an underdog story. And Hamilton honors the role of founding mothers. It is Eliza, the wife of Alexander, who lives 50 years after Alexander's death, who keeps the memory of Alexander alive. If it were not for Eliza, Alexander Hamilton would be considered some tangential founding father. And we may not even have the musical Hamilton today. Yes, there is much to celebrate in this hip hop, revolutionary, boundary crossing, cultural phenomenon known as Hamilton. But perhaps the most important offering of this musical is not a specific message, but the underlying belief in stories and their power to change the world. As we listen to the stories of Hamilton, we are inspired to tell our own stories. And in the words of Lin-Manuel Miranda, the composer and producer of Hamilton, as we tell our stories, the new, this newly kaleidoscopic America comes to know itself a little more deeply. The power of stories is brought home in the final song of the musical, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Who Tells Your Story. Let me tell you what I wish I'd known when I was young and dreamed of glory. You have no control who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Every other founding father's story gets told. Every other founding father gets to grow old. And when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? Who tells your story? Thank you, Val, for sharing that final song with us. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? beautifully sung, Val. Thank you. Yes, we celebrate the art of storytelling as shared in the musical Hamilton. But there is a part of the story, however, that has been neglected in the musical, and that is the role of slavery. The musical falls short in portraying the horrors of slavery and glosses over the role that slavery played in the lives of our founding fathers. Seven out of 10 founding fathers were enslavers. And I use the term enslaver rather than slaveholder because slaveholder is too benign of a term to use. And while there is no evidence that Alexander Hamilton himself was an enslaver, we do know that he participated in the slave trade in the Caribbean and he married into an influential, enslaving family. Yes, Eliza's father, General Philip Schuyler, was an enslaver, and he had very little interest in the abolitionist movement. Even at the time of his death, at least seven people, including three children, were still laboring in slavery at his estate in Albany. 
In recent weeks, the mayor of Albany actually ordered the removal of a statue of General Philip Schuyler in front of the Albany City Hall. Founding fathers were imperfect. They were flawed human beings. They participated in slavery. And the biggest criticism that Hamilton has received, the musical, is that it does not portray the horrors of slavery. But to Lin-Manuel Miranda's credit, all criticisms are valid, he says. I spent six years putting as much as I could into a two and a half hour musical. So I say, let's help out Lin-Manuel Miranda and let's put some flesh on the story of slavery during the time of the Revolutionary War. 401 years ago, in late August, about 20 Africans were captured in the African interior, probably near modern-day Angola, and forcibly transported on a slave ship headed to the Americas. After tumultuous months at sea, they landed ashore in the first British colony. Unfortunately, the story of chattel slavery has been misrepresented in our history books through omissions, downright errors, and narratives that are more interested in emphasizing the compassion of enslavers rather than the cruelty endured by the enslaved. Listen to what some of the history books circulating in our schools say about slavery. They, that is, enslaved Africans, were allowed all the freedom they wanted, and all that was required of them was to be in place when work time came. At the holiday season, they were almost as free as their masters, declare some history books. And this, a feeling of strong affection existed between masters and slaves, in the majority of Virginia homes. And this, slavery was an educational process which transformed the black man from a primitive to a civilized person, endowed with customs, industrial skills, Christian beliefs and ideals. Some school districts even incorporated slavery into their math equations. In 2012, an Atlanta elementary school posed this homework question. If Frederick received two beatings per day, how many did he receive in a week? In two weeks. That is absolutely horrific. And just last year in Texas, eighth graders were asked to compare the pros and cons of slavery. Undoubtedly, slavery has been poorly represented and misrepresented in history books and in schools, mainly because those stories have been told by white people. History books have been written by white people. And I give thanks for the Reverend Otis Moss III, a United Church of Christ pastor of African descent who paints a different picture of slavery for us. He says this, Black men, women, and children without permission gave their genius, intellectual creativity, and spiritual vitality to enrich colonial territories. America is America because of black labor and black genius. The wealth of Wall Street was cultivated from the soil of an illicit trade and branded on the backs of a stolen people. This myth of race is a socially constructed lie where people in power defined another group with arbitrary characteristics. He goes on to say, we became a caste and not an ethnicity by a people who feared our potential and were terrified of our power. 
Our color was weaponized. We were brilliant enough to feed white children, nurse them at our breast, rotate crops, plant and engineer new agricultural species, design and build homes and bridges. We could train horses, domesticate wild animals, and introduce new cooking techniques to America, expose the world to new musical genres, and delight the nation with our oral dexterity to tell a story. We could recite verses from memory, create poetry on the spot, yet the myth stated that we still were not intelligent and physically dangerous due to our beautifully melanated skin, even though the entire economic system of America rested on our ingenuity. It should be noted, even though this lie was being communicated, we by nature were and are a people of resistance. Our faith was and is a faith of resistance. The Christianity practiced by people of African descent led to revolts and radical resistance and a new interpretation of what it meant to follow Jesus. We saw Jesus not as a European given to us by missionaries, but as a dark-skinned Palestinian Jew who stood on the side of the oppressed. Jesus was for us and with us as a Savior who knew the pain of occupation and knew the heartache of loved ones being brutalized by occupying forces. The disease of racial terror spread, but the vaccine of our spirituality demanded we fight. As people of the Spirit, when we pray, we also protest. Our ring shouts are connected to resistance, our songs connected to service. The tradition has never been either or, but always both and, merging the sacred and the secular. From the moment we placed our feet upon this foreign soil, we resisted. We held fast to a spirituality and a spirit saying in our hearts, Before I be a slave, I will be buried in my grave. Our faith is a faith of resistance. Our journey has been a journey of resistance, not acceptance. Our faith never caused us to accept oppression, and our faith never made us docile. This is a lie. There was a reason reading the Bible was illegal. There was a reason reading the gospel was outlawed. There was a reason a man or a woman could not preach without a white person present. Those who tried to hold our souls hostage New reading leads to resistance. In reading the words of Jesus and the actions of Moses will lead to underground railroads and abolition and civil rights. We are a people of resistance. Thank you, Reverend Otis Moss III, for sharing a more accurate portrayal of slavery during the time of the revolution. Hamilton is a musical about the revolution, about gaining independence from the British on July 4th, 1776. And Frederick Douglass, who once was enslaved himself, said this, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Indeed, there were two revolutions taking place during the time of Hamilton. The revolution fought by the American colonists to gain independence from the British. 
But there was another revolution taking place, and it was the revolution of resistance by enslaved Africans who knew that God is a God of liberation. May we tell the stories of both revolutions faithfully. Who lives? Who dies? And who tells your story? Amen. Join me in the prayer of dedication. Each of these gifts is a story unto itself, the inspiring stories of learning, of hard work, of dedication, and yes, the lesser understood stories of privilege, race, class, geography, and power. But by giving them to you, O oh God, we begin to set them and ourselves free at last. Amen. Jesus and the 
Christmas love I love to tell the story Because I know it's true It satisfies my longings As nothing else can do I love to tell the story And when I am in glory I'll tell the old, old story of Jesus and this love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems, than all the golden visions of all our golden dreams. I love to tell the story, I tell it now to you, because I want to share it, because I know it's true. I love to tell the story, and when I am in glory, I'll tell the old, old story of Jesus and this love. I love to tell the story, it's pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, and when I am in glory, I'll tell the old, old story of Jesus and this love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best, seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when I sing in glory, I know the new, new song will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, and when I am in glory, I'll tell the old, old story of Jesus and the Slav. May we always share the story of Jesus' endless love. And I am grateful for the love shown to us by the mystery artist with pictures of you. And here are this week's drawings by our mystery artist. Welcome, Cynthia. Welcome, Monroe. Welcome, Cherie and Patty. It is so good to have you in worship with us this morning. And now, filled with the abundant life of the Creator, the endless love of Jesus, and the deep peace of the Holy Spirit, go forth as champions of justice. Let us make sure that everyone's story is heard, including your own. Go forth in peace and love. Amen and amen.